Grandpa stole his first buggy in 1892. Uh, I met your grandma, Big Sloppin', in 46. Oh, every Christmas, we'd visit my Uncle Fred in prison. And welcome to another edition of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. Well, I hope you're doing well, genies. It's uh, been a while since we talked because, uh, well, I couldn't talk for the last couple of weeks. And uh, came down with a nasty bug right after Roots Tech, actually. My wife has gotten it now, as I've gotten on the men, but she has been tested. So no COVID here, just the nasty flu bug and that we don't hear a whole lot about. But that's affecting a lot of people as well. But it's great to be back with you. We're actually doing the show for the first time from my home studio as we socially isolate. It's great to have you along. David Allen Lambert is back, of course, from the New England Historic Genealogical Society at AmericanAncestors.org. He is the chief genealogist there. David, how are you, buddy? You staying well? I'm doing well. I'm actually at home with my family and staying out of Beantown for a little while. Yeah. But I want to say, for the first time in History Fish, we can actually help save the human race by laying in front of the television and doing nothing at all. Doing nothing at all. This is it. I mean, past generations have been asked to bear arms and go out and defend the country. All we're asked to do is just stay home and let our 401ks crash. But, you know, that's a whole other story <laughs> from there. So anyway, a couple, I've done a couple of things in isolation. First of all, as this was just first coming on, I actually broke open a line, and I've written about it on my blog on our, our weekly Genie newsletter. And then at the back end of it, I actually found some DNA matches that exposed another line of descent from one of my revolutionary soldiers. So it's given me a little something to do there. Oh, and then there was the experience, Dave, of the 2020 census. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's pretty disturbing, isn't it? Oh, my We're gosh. There's less information on this than, say, comparatively with, say, I don't know, the 1850 census, which had more. It's strange. It's bizarre. But, you know, I'm thinking 72 years from now, my grandkids and great-grandkids are not going to be anxiously awaiting the publication of this particular census. I mean, just get on it, get it done. You're required to do it, and we'll we'll kind of go from there. By the way, I got to mention, I'm very excited because at Roots Tech, we haven't had much chance to talk about it because, well, I mm-hmm. couldn't I couldn't talk. But Kara Porter's going to be on the show today for two segments, and okay. she is the one who is putting together a place to analyze our heirlooms for DNA. And we're talking about envelopes and hats and jewelry and all kinds of things they're just getting started trying to figure out exactly you know what the success rate might be for various items and how far back they can go Uh, i recorded this of course before everything happened and they were talking about opening on april 25th that is obviously not going to happen as a public event in all likelihood so keep that in mind but uh, we'll be getting to that coming up in just a little bit i think it's going to be a fabulously fascinating thing, something we can all look forward to as uh, time moves on, because obviously we just keep getting better and better with what we can analyze. Wouldn't that be something to have a hat from a great-grandfather analyzed for their DNA? My grandfather died four years before I was born. I have his glasses, and I'd love to be able to have a look at those. Well, uh, exactly. And if you haven't put them on your own nose, it's likely to still have his DNA there. That's true. So the rule of thumb is never clean your glasses. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you never quite know what you're going to find when you open a book that you bought at a yard sale. Now, in this case, someone found in an old family Bible, which is, of course, genealogically valuable in its own right, they found a World War I draft registration card for Clem Claire Hubbard of Toledo, Ohio. And with the aid of a local genealogical group in the library, They were able to pinpoint it, and now the card is going back to Toledo. Isn't that cool? Yeah. They just went right to the genealogical department and said, hey, help me find descendants of this person. And they returned the draft card, and uh, it's 100 years old. That is just so awesome, especially for the younger members of that family to have. Well, you know, moving ahead with our stories, uh, in my own home state of Massachusetts, we lost a 98-year-old Pearl Harbor survivor, Emory Arsenal 
who was on a radar station located at Pearl Harbor. So another one of the boys from Pearl is no longer with us. Right. And a radar operator, no less. So he was one of the first to know something was coming in. That is very true. Well, you know, one of the things that radar does is ground penetrating radar. And out at Bloomfield Manor in Centerville, Maryland, they have used this to find graves. In fact, they found 11 of them in This is for a family of Edward Bork. They could tell from a 1916 photograph that there was a little fence and some gravestones. Now the fence and the gravestones aren't there, but graves still are. And ground penetrating radar found them. Wow. And so they're hoping to uh, take the home that's right there in front of it and restore it as an historic landmark. That it's going to be really fun to see what happens with that once things get back to normal. Exactly. Hey, how many times have they misspelled Fisher? I mean, I'm sure they've added a C in there when they don't. Oh, I get that all the time. Say, what will make me a German and I'm a British man, you know? (laughs) Well, for genealogy, one of the tips I always say is misspell the name. And that's what one person did. And he was able to find that he had an Aunt Ruby that he didn't know about based upon looking for someone else. And then he found that he had an Aunt Ruby, but he also found that the family had a child named Ruby. It died back about 1908. They were only five years old. So sometimes misspelling a name can lead to finding other things. And he did this by finding a tree on Ancestry that listed this family member that he didn't know about. Isn't that fun? Always great to connect with people, even if it's with DNA or those shaky leaves occasionally. Absolutely. You know, like I was saying, Fish, I'm actually home for probably the near future. But American ancestors and NEHS, we're still open in a way. Every Tuesday through Saturday from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, if you go to American Ancestors, you can find a link for our chat service. You can go in, ask us a question. Maybe we can mull over together some suggestions for you to help you with your research because there's a lot of free genealogical time on your hands. Exactly. David, thanks for the chat. We're going to talk to you later with Ask Us Anything. And uh, coming up, we're going to talk to Kara Porter. She is starting a new service that is going to help all of us Finding DNA on some of the heirlooms you might have around the house. What can you do to help them determine the accuracy of their service? And what might this wind up doing for you? You're going to find out in two segments starting in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Hey, Genies, it is Fisher, and it was sure fun to watch the memory web booth when I was at Roots Tech in Salt Lake City in late February, as so many people got to know my friends Chris and Nancy Desmond. They are the co-creators of Memory Web, the 21st century way to preserve your photographs along with all the metadata that goes with it. Who's in those pictures? What year was that taken? What's the story behind the photograph? Where was it taken? How would you like to be able to organize all your photographs digitally and and then search them as if you were doing a Google search. It's really that easy. And you can find out how easy it is by going to their website, memoryweb.me slash extreme genes. That's memoryweb.me slash extreme genes. There is no product for organizing photos that you'll find on the market that's better than Memory Web. Find out for yourself. You've got the time. What a great project to be doing over the next several months. That's memoryweb.me slash extreme genes. Have you hit a brick wall in your family tree? Are you unsure how to use your DNA test results to resolve a research question? Do you want to travel where your ancestors walked and need to find details before you go? Need help joining a lineage society? Whatever your genealogy research question, the answer is Legacy Tree Genealogists. Legacy Tree Genealogists has been helping clients all over the globe discover their story since 2004. Legacy Tree has carefully selected and trained professionals who specialize in hundreds of countries and languages, as well as probate research and DNA analysis. And when you need experts on the ground in the countries where your ancestors came from, Legacy Tree Genealogist calls upon its global network of on-site researchers who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Legacy Tree Genealogist is the world's highest client-rated genealogy research firm and is recommended by genealogy industry leaders worldwide, including MyHeritage, 23andMe, and more. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. That's LegacyTree.com. Hey, Genies, it is Fisher, and everyone loves stories. From tales of daring dues to family legends about great Auntie Gemma's secret recipe for scones, stories connect us to our past, make sense of the present, and create the future. 
This year, Roots Tech, the world's largest genealogy conference, celebrated the story of you. The event kicked off by celebrating 10 years of Roots Tech with a look back at the stories the genealogy community has created together over the years. Attendees enrich their stories with classes about DNA and records and new technology. Keynotes this year included the inspiration behind the film The Blind Side, Leanne Tui, Pulitzer Prize winning photographer David Kennerly, and the NFL's all-time leading rusher Emmett Smith. If you missed any part of these stories, you can purchase a virtual pass to gain access to 29 additional classes. The full virtual pass is available for only $129. You can watch the free session and purchase a virtual pass right now at rootstech.org. And welcome back to Extreme Genes, America's family history show and extremegenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And there's just so much still to talk to you about from Roots Tech in Salt Lake City, Utah, at the very end of February. And I think perhaps the booth that really intrigued me the most was the one from Keepsake DNA. And uh, I don't even know where to begin with this, but that's why I had to get Kara Porter on the line. She is uh, one of the people behind it, working with the Utah Cold Case Coalition for law enforcement help. But they're also making some space in this new DNA lab to help family history researchers. Hi, Kara. How are you? Welcome to the show. Hi, Scott. Hey, thanks for having me. This is uh, unbelievable to me, and obviously there is still a lot to be proven. And let's just start, first of all, talking about your background. You're an attorney, and yet you're making all this spare time to work with DNA, in large part for the Utah Cold Case Coalition. Well, you know, that's how it started. The The lab originally was being created just for forensic type things. But then, frankly, uh, I have a passion for the genealogy part of this. I mean, I've been doing genealogy for 45 years and even to the point of having my mother's biological father exhumed. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, actually he died in 1963. He's a cold case homicide victim in Wyoming. And so I got a court order and had him exhumed for DNA testing for the genealogy part of it. And right. then, then I couldn't find a lab to test it for genealogy. You know, there were labs out there that were willing to test it, you know, for like crime purposes or something. Sure. But that was not my interest. And that's really what led to the formation of Keepsake DNA. And what did you obtain from your grandfather? Um, we got a piece of femur and a molar, and he had not been buried very um, professionally. I'll just put it that way. Okay. But we did get that, and even then, I had to pay somebody from the Arkansas Crime Lab to come down and, and get that, and I thought, there just has to be a better way for genealogists, and that was four years ago, and since then, we have been working on the genealogy side of the DNA testing. Right. Now, this uh, grand opening of your lab is coming in Utah, in Salt Lake City, as I understand, on April 25th, right? Yes. It'll be a big bash. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be, because obviously there are a lot of uh, law enforcement people who are really looking forward to this. How much of the lab is going to be devoted to law enforcement, and how much to the genealogical side for the rest of us? You know, it kind of depends on how many genealogists want to do this. We're committed. I mean, like I said, my mother and I have been doing our genealogy for 45 years. So if we get enough interest from the genealogy market, we'll probably just add staff rather than cut back. But I do want to make one thing very clear. Although the lab started because there was a need in forensics, there's no sharing of information. There's no, you know, police, law enforcement do not have access to the genealogy part. It just so happens that we had a lab in place for forensic things and law enforcement. And then now we are adding a genealogy component to it. But like the machine is, you know, in a different place. It's a different process. So I don't want people thinking that if they send their grandpa's hat in that it's somehow going to end up in CODIS. Right. (laughs) That makes sense. Well, I'm glad you clarified that because I'm thinking, you know, I don't know how many people would be too anxious to send in grandpa's femur and and, and molar. So let's uh, start about some of the things you feel that you're going to be able to create a genome from for some earlier ancestors. 
you know, the list is, is encouraging to us. We knew that we were going to be dealing with degraded samples, so we did have to purchase additional equipment. I mean, we purchased the world's most sophisticated technology, and we did not need that if this lab had just limited itself to law enforcement or whatever. Right. So we did that because it, it has a better success rate on degraded DNA. And of course, obviously, we've spent a lot of time talking to the lab director and the recruits at this lab are all crime lab people, which we thought would be extremely helpful in getting DNA from unusual or difficult sources. Sure. You know, like you have to do with genealogy. Well, in the last few years, we've heard a lot of talk from uh, different companies about getting DNA from envelopes and flaps. And mm -hmm. some have worked well and some not so well. But you've got kind of an upgraded system with this that gives us a lot of hope, doesn't it? Yeah, we do. I, a year ago, I wouldn't have even tried this. At least in our perception, the technology was not there yet. And then all of a sudden, this technology became certified, became available. There is a new panel that's going to be coming out that is tied specifically to GEDmatch's parameters. Oh, wow. I mean, which will make it extremely sensitive in a good way. Mm -hmm. So now, though, we know that this can be done, but this is pretty new. Like I said, a year ago, we wouldn't have tried this. Sure. At Roots Tech, I was talking with you and Blaine Bettinger, and he's very interested in this. And for those who don't know Blaine, he is one of the nation's foremost uh, DNA specialists. And obviously, we all want to know what percentage of likelihood for success are we going to have if we were to send in an envelope or we were to send in a hat or, or something with a piece of jewelry maybe that was kept in grandma's ear and still has DNA on it? And that's going to be a really interesting process as uh, you put it all together. Because I know you don't even have prices figured out yet because you've got the equipment coming in and you've got to know what those success rates are so people know what their risks are because it's probably going to be pretty expensive, right? You know, and the thing about the price list, we frankly just didn't give the lab director enough time um, on that. <laughs> I mean, I guess it will depend on your definition of expensive. It's not easy like, let's say, spitting into a tube and mailing it off. Sure. There's a process that has to be followed. And for some people, unfortunately, they may be priced out of it, but we're going to do our best to keep it reasonable. And with respect to the success rates, um, I think it's important also to be transparent Plus, the lab guys, I mean, they've gotten usable DNA off of a huge, long list of things. And so they're pretty comfortable. But we thought what we ought to do, and we talked with Blaine about this and, and with you at Roots Tech, was we thought, you know, what we need to do is we need to take these envelopes and like do it by decade. Right. That's and a so, great idea. Yeah. And then we'll post the, the results. One thing we haven't tried is to see how far back we can go, but we've now ordered envelopes back to the mid 1800s. And so we're going to go back decade by decade and we're going to post. Well, the way that we can do it, if you don't mind me just no, go very ahead. briefly explaining, we want the, the kind of the souped up panel, the one that is being customized for GEDmatch. Right. Right. And that's coming so, soon. Yeah, that's coming soon. You know, it's being made by Verigen which, of course, bought GEDmatch. Okay. So uh, we're just waiting for that. Uh, you know, we're in fairly constant contact with them. But what we are able to do while we're waiting for the souped-up panel is we are still able to go through all of the steps up to that point to determine whether or not we can get enough DNA to get a profile. So what we do is, like, let's say we take an envelope or a hairbrush or whatever, and it goes through a... a serology process, and I know people are going to say that means blood, but in the <laughs> DNA context, it also means that you're identifying where the DNA is, and then we will chemically extract the DNA. Then you run it through what they call quant, quantification. And the quant process tells you three things. It tells you, do you have the right amount of DNA to get a full profile? Right. Because you can't, you can't have too much. Actually, too much is a problem. Really? You need to have it within a range. Okay. Now, if you have too much, you can, you know, you can save some of it, but the machines that run the profiles need it to be within a, a particular range. So this quant machine will tell us, let's say for each envelope from 1940 or whatever, it will tell us how much DNA... And if it's the right amount, it will tell us if there was male DNA in there. And it will tell us the degree of degradation of the DNA. Okay. And if it's and so, degraded, uh, I, can you do anything with it? Yeah, you still can. But if it says it's really degraded, then we might have a problem. But if it's just slightly degraded or somewhat degraded, 
then we should still be okay. Okay. So this first step then is basically to figure out whether you can get enough DNA to create the profile. And then when you get this new Wowie panel in, you'll be able to run it and actually create the profile. Yeah. I mean, we could create a profile now, but it would not be the customized panel that works for GEDmatch. Okay. So there's really not a lot of point to it because our guys can tell from the quant process if they will be able to get a profile from it. Right. And, and they're and, basically trying to show you because they're pretty confident and you want to see it, obviously, because you're the one putting yourself out there to make sure that this thing is uh, successful enough to justify getting people to share their precious items. Exactly. I mean, they are pretty confident, almost to the point of arrogance about this. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, okay, I, you know, I know that, but I, I want to see it. And more important, I want to put the figures on there. Sure. Um, and so, you know, we've bought a bunch of envelopes because that's, that's been a very popular How'd request. you do it? Uh, you know what? We just bought them off of eBay. Nice. Were um, they in big bunches? Yeah, different lots, different mass numbers of envelopes. Okay. Because we wanted to make this a fair sample, and things that affect DNA include, like, how they've been stored. So we wanted to make sure we right. didn't have all of them from somebody that preserved them perfectly. And we wanted to make sure we had them from different parts of the country. Sure, different yeah. Different families. I mean, you, you, I think you probably know this, but some people, it's called shedding. <laughs> um, some people are shedders and some aren't i mean have you ever read the, the study about uh they they had a water bottle and it was you know clean and everything and then they had one person grasp the water bottle for 30 seconds and then hand it to a second person who held on to the water bottle for 30 seconds and then they handed it to the a third person who held the water bottle for 30 seconds and they did that using a lot of different people and in some cases the DNA of all three would show up. And there were some where the DNA of the second person didn't, but the DNA of the first and third persons did. Interesting. Okay, we got to okay. take a break, Kara. We've got a lot of ground still to cover here because you're going to give Extreme Genes listeners a chance to help you with the tests. And I think that's going to be very fun. We'll be back with Kara Porter and more about Keepsake DNA when we return in five minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Masters' option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. Zap the grandma gap .com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Oh, look at this list here. Jewelry, hair, hats, eyeglasses, hearing aids, false teeth, envelopes, 
I mean, the list goes on and on. Hey, it's Fisher. It's Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. And I'm talking to Kara Porter. She's an attorney. She's uh, one of the people behind Keepsake DNA that had a booth at Roots Tech. And uh, she and Blaine Bettinger and I have been talking about the opening of their DNA lab. It's going to be largely for police work although the police work is completely separate for the other side, which is Kara's passionate side, genealogy. And Carrie, we were just talking about all you have to do to get ready for this and to double check the effectiveness rate as we go forward. So I know you need stuff. What can our listeners help you get and what should they expect and what should they not expect? Yeah, and what we're doing right now, and if I can just clarify one thing, our lab director has been on board since last October getting all of the equipment lined up and all of those things. The April date is the date that we're open to the public. April They've 25th. Been, right. I mean, the lab has been running samples, you know, for a long time. It's just that now we're going to make it available to the public on DNA Day, April mm-hmm. 25th. But what we're going to do in the meantime, because we want people to have some transparency and there's no guarantees, we're going to actually test certain numbers of items, like for each decade of envelopes, for example. And, of course, we've got plenty of envelopes to go around on that. We're going to test just randomly provided, like hairbrushes, locks of hair, since those don't have roots. Right. So Can you do that do... without roots? It's always been you got to have the root. It is. And I doubt it is harder. And that is the one thing that we're still checking on. It can be done. We're just wanting to make sure that it can be done in a way that is not cost prohibitive. Mm. Because that may require the use of some additional equipment. I see. That's one reason why we didn't have the complete price list yet, just because it, there's different machines. But we're going to test X number of you know, baseball caps. And so what we're in the process now is trying to get enough of each of the subjects so that we can post it on the website and tell people and say, we tested 12 baseball caps or whatever, and here's what the results were. We tested 12 envelopes from 1880s, and here's what the results were. Okay. That'll be fascinating. So what all all do you want? You don't need the envelopes because you've gotten most of those in big batches off of eBay, and you're trying to get Mm -hmm. a variety of things as we spoke about in the first segment. What can people help you with, and what would they get out of it? Well, aside from helping mankind, no, just kidding. Um, (laughs) What we need help with are things that are a little bit harder to come by locally. The number one most difficult thing to come by is human bone for obvious reasons. Sure. But, I mean, I'll just come right out and say it, okay? It's maybe a little bit ghastly, but like if you have cremated remains in an urn, there is often bone left in, in those ashes. And we need to test those. Mm-hmm. And that's hard to come by, Like again, obviously. Sure. And so if somebody can provide for us a piece of human bone and we can confirm where it came from, then once we get the souped-up panel, the one that is specific, we would actually run that profile. You'd run the profile just to see well, that it words, matches up. Yeah, we would run the whole process on the human bone as long as we're satisfied that it's human, which we can tell from the DNA testing, and as long as we're satisfied where it came from. We don't want anybody going and digging in a graveyard. Now, there's no reason that you would. (laughs) No. So you need that. um, But what other things could you use to help test the um, effectiveness of this process? Well, like, for example, jewelry that hasn't been handled. uh, Like, for example, a a ring where the inside of the ring has remained untouched. You know, like maybe it's only been handled on the outside. Mm -hmm. And that would not be destroyed by any kind of testing. Sure. So we need things like that or an earring that has a post, you know, like for pierced ears. Right. If that hasn't been worn. We're hoping to get enough hats locally, but we want two different kinds of hats. We want baseball caps and we want, you know, like cowboy hats or whatever, like my grandpa used to wear. Okay. (laughs) Because there are different linings there. Right. The lining is the key for hats, I would imagine. It is. That's that's typically your best source. Okay. So we need those kinds of things. We need, i, I got to tell you, hearing aids. Oh, wow. Is something that is very helpful. Dentures, and, and we were sort of pleasantly surprised at how many people actually have that for their parents or whatever. What about toothbrushes? And toothbrushes. I mean, we, what we'd really like is something that isn't just brand new, though. We would like something that is kind of older. Mm-hmm. How old? Um, well, I mean, the older the better, frankly. Sure. Yeah. But, you know, because what we're dealing with with genealogy DNA is, you know, is degraded or older samples. Right. So it wouldn't really help to have somebody go buy a toothbrush and then use it and then send it to us. 
that that would yeah. be yeah, yeah. It's helpful. Well, and, and we're not going to have anybody send anything to you without checking in first, right? True. Uh, that's true. This is how I'm foreseeing it here. We're trying to see what we can get locally just to have enough numbers so that we can say we've run X number of, of samples. There's going to be some things that, that fill up pretty fast. If somebody has something out there that, that seems like it would fit in what we're talking about, the reading glasses, the eyeglasses, if you haven't handled the part that rests on the bridge of the nose. Right. You and know, maybe because it doesn't thing. fit you, you wouldn't even try, right? You'd break it. Well, them. yeah, or... Sure. Well, also prescription glasses. Most people don't wear each other's prescription glasses, at least not extensively. So if somebody were to email us, it's betty at keepsakedna.com and tell us what they had. Here is what they would get if we wrote back and said, oh, yeah, please get us that. Sure. We would go through the first process, the process of identifying, extracting and measuring the amount of DNA. Okay. That's the first phase anyway. So that part would be on us. And normally, okay. that is a cost that we have to charge because it's chemicals and staff and all Sure, that. of course. And this, so basically, we would then be able to say, we have enough to run a profile. So what, what do you want next? You know, that kind of thing. Sure. So that would save people the cost of the first part. Plus, mm-hmm. they would know if we think we can get a good Yeah, sample. that's right. It kind of removes some of the risk, doesn't it? It really does. There's Some of these things are going to be hard to get, but we're really hoping for them. We had a lot of people with very interesting items So even if you haven't heard us describe what you guys have, I'm talking to your listeners. Right, um, right. And you think, well, I don't know. Is this too weird? Please email us. (laughs) I I have a bloody couch cushion that a murder victim's mother brought in just to say, I didn't know if you'd ever need to do anything with this. Well, now I'm going to have that tested. Wow. That's incredible. Well, and, and this is, of course, part of your love for law enforcement. And once again, we need to reinforce what you send in and do with this genealogical side of this lab has nothing to do with the law enforcement. That's a completely separate branch of this Correct. lab. And it's really important that people understand that going forward. So once again, the email to reach out to Keepsake DNA is Betty at KeepsakeDNA.com. And just describe what you've got, and if it's something they're going to be interested in, they will let you know. They'll let you know how to get it there. They'll, again, review what you get, what you don't get. Uh, This is just the beginning, and basically you're helping Kara and those involved with this lab to basically calibrate what they've got so that they can tell everybody exactly how effective it's going to be and what we might expect from it. And I look forward to doing some of this to find out exactly what this does, because imagine if you got a parent tested, you know, a parent who's been deceased for many years or even a grandparent, and you come up with their genome profile, you could come up with matches that nobody living now could possibly match. Oh, I tell you, I can't wait. I've got my grandma's envelopes sitting there right now. (laughs) Ready to go. Ready to go. Yeah. I, I do just want to mention one thing about the fact that this lab has clients who are law enforcement. At this point, I don't think you could sustain a lab just on the genealogy. That's right. If it turns out that we can, then it will become a separate lab. And instead of hiring them to do this or whatever, it would just be a separate lab. But you, you wouldn't be able to do this unless the lab had other clients. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. She's Kara Porter. She's one of the people behind Keepsake DNA. They were featured at Roots Tech, and the countdown is on till April 25th when you have your grand opening in Salt Lake City, Utah for the public. That's going to be great fun. Yeah, I hope to see you there. Kara, thanks so much for coming on, and uh, we will be talking a lot, I think, through the coming year. Oh, yeah, for sure. David is back as we do another round of Ask Us Anything next. Genies, it's Fisher with a thanks and a shout out to members of our Extreme Genes Patron Club. We are blessed to have so many friends of the show supporting Extreme Genes. Monthly contributions start at just a dollar and go up to the cost of a couple of really tasty large smoothies with added fruit. Just $8. Patron Club member benefits include early podcast access. And our special bonus podcasts include photo experts, legal experts, DNA specialists, and so many more. You can even get expert advice on specific questions you're struggling with in your family history research. So go to patreon.com slash extreme genes and get signed up. That's patreon.com slash extreme genes. Now, I know those smoothies would taste great but they're not nearly as satisfying as discovering your family. 
the choice is yours. So get signed up right now. We look forward to helping you out. And thanks for supporting Extreme Genes. Have you hit a brick wall in your family tree? Are you unsure how to use your DNA test results to resolve a research question? Do you want to travel where your ancestors walked and need to find details before you go? Need help joining a lineage society? Whatever your genealogy research question, the answer is Legacy Tree Genealogists. Legacy Tree Genealogists has been helping clients all over the globe discover their story since 2004. Legacy Tree has carefully selected and trained professionals who specialize in hundreds of countries and languages, as well as probate research and DNA analysis. And when you need experts on the ground in the countries where your ancestors came from, Legacy Tree Genealogist calls upon its global network of on-site researchers who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Legacy Tree Genealogist is the world's highest client-rated genealogy research firm and is recommended by genealogy industry leaders worldwide, including MyHeritage, 23andMe, and more. Request your free quote today at Legacy tree.com that's legacytree.com hey genies it is fisher and it was sure fun to watch the memory web booth when i was at roots tech in salt lake city in late february as so many people got to know my friends chris and nancy desmond they are the co-creators of memory web the 21st century way to preserve your photographs along with all the metadata that goes with it who's in those pictures what year was that taken what's the story behind the photograph where was it taken how would you like to be able to organize all your photographs digitally and then search them as if you were doing a Google search. It's really that easy. And you can find out how easy it is by going to their website, memoryweb.me slash extreme genes. That's memoryweb.me slash extreme genes. There is no product for organizing photos that you'll find on the market that's better than memory web. Find out for yourself. You've got the time. What a great project to be doing over the next several months. That's memory memoryweb.me slash extreme genes. All right, we are back on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And it is time once again for Ask Us Anything with David Allen Lambert. He is the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. And uh, David, our question today comes from Ginny in Pawkatuck, Connecticut. She says, okay, guys, what have you got to keep us busy for the next several months? I think she's thinking straight. What do you have, David? Um, one of the projects that you might look at in your hometown, especially in New England, and Connecticut being from Pawkatuck, there were probably people that were in an almshouse. These are people that really don't have stories. And I've taken it upon myself in my hometown in Massachusetts to research them. A lot of them don't have marked graves, but they may have a record. Maybe money was supplied for their care or there was um, you know, food or clothing given to them. But actually, in a lot of places... You'll find pauper rolls where the states are actually supplying money uh, oh, wow. to the towns for care. So say, for instance, you and your wife, Fish, had taken in an elderly person who lost her husband and she had no way to care for herself. Whatever supplies or nursing or doctoring or food or board, room and board that you gave her, you could then make a letter to your town selectman. The town selectman at the end of the year or at the end of the quarter would contact the state and they would make a request for money for, quote, state paupers. Now, obviously, you had to fit a criteria to be a pauper. And, of course, that's going to be different in every state, in different eras. But it is one way of kind of giving back to your community. I mean, and as a genealogist, if we take our skills and adopt a community project, obviously not going out to the cemeteries and copying right. gravestones or going to the public library and doing things, things that we can use with the resources we already have. May it be an online database, or maybe it's something that you've not even thought of and you want to let us know and we can pass it along to somebody else. Exactly. You know, there there's going to be a lot of time now on our hands because who knows how long this thing's going to happen. But it's going to be very interesting uh, to see how much we can actually accomplish over the next several months. Yeah, I mean, you might be able to do work that would have otherwise taken you years to do. And uh, hopefully we can all make it fulfilling for one another. Do you know one of the other things, Fish, is that there are so many indexing opportunities and the HGS and American Ancestors has volunteer requests to index things, as well as 
family search yep. has lots of projects that can keep you busy. Yeah, that's a really good point. And if you haven't ever done it, it's really easy to do. And they've got instructions for it right on the website, familysearch.org and at americanancestors.org. And, uh, you know, it just helps so many other people. And sometimes you can do projects from towns that you have lots of people in and you can find interesting stuff there. Mm -hmm. I did that for New Hampshire census early on with family search. And I got to pick the county in the part of the uh, state that I wanted to do. And I did it. Wow. The other thing that you might consider doing is social media, of course, works for social distancing. Create a group on Facebook, maybe one for your hometown where people that can gather together and maybe virtually work on the project together. You know, you might be able to find there's a lot of free time with your neighbors. And when this is all said and done and finished, you can all get together and celebrate what you've created, which I think is uh, something to look forward to. That's a really neat idea, too. And wasn't there somebody recently who was helping people put together uh, family history websites that they could all collaborate on? That's true. There's uh, one called Name and Place. It's based uh, in England, and they're having an American component to it. So nameandplace.co.uk, you can adopt a community, and there is a bit of a fee, but it's not very much. And hey, think of all those McDonald's meals you can't pay for anymore because you don't really can't go to McDonald's. You can go and do some family history with it. All right, let's take a break. And when we return, we'll continue with Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show in three minutes. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Media Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to transferduplication.com. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for the Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the Chief Genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. All right, back at it on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. It is Fisher here with David Allen Lambert from AmericanAncestors.org. He is the chief genealogist there, of course, at NEHGS. And we got an email here, of course, David, from Jack Milford. He's in Charleston, South Carolina. He says, Fish and Dave, I was planning this spring to go up to New Hampshire to investigate more about my ancestor's land. He originally bought 600 acres, but by the time he died in his 80s, it was down to like 60 acres. How do I find out more since I can't go traveling anytime soon? Well, even with a coronavirus, this can be done from home. So you still want to get a chance to get up to New Hampshire is really pretty. So maybe in the fall when the leaves are out, it might be more of a 
acceptable time for you to go. However, between now and then, you go to familysearch.org, and if you go to the catalog search, you can put in the county in New Hampshire that you're looking for. Now, they're going to have all sorts of things, probates, they're going to have court records. Well, in this case, you want land records. Now, the one thing about the land records, because they're so large, there's really not a lot of collections that are already indexed. So you're going to have to browse through the images. And if you don't have an account on familysearch.org, it's very easy to sign up and get one for free. Uh, From there, you'll be able to have image access. Now, a lot of things on Family Search, as you know, Fish, have to be at the library or at an affiliate library. Not so much with deeds. Right. Deeds seem across the board. I don't know if you've noticed it. Uh, You can get them without uh, having to be at an affiliate. So I can check my own county's deeds right from home. So you're going to go through the grantor indexes, and that's going to tell you when your ancestors sold land and grantee when they purchased land. The other thing that's out there, you can actually look at the deeds itself, download them, print them off. Uh, You could probably figure out how that large amount of land got chiseled down to the amount that was there when he died. There are other things, newspapers. Newspapers have land sales. They have sheriff sales when someone loses their land because of debt. There are things on there that may even surprise you. Maybe your ancestor's barn burnt down. So you can find stories you may have never even thought were possible by searching on your ancestor plus the community that he was living at. The other thing in New England are poll tax. You had to pay a tax based on your property holdings. And on the poll tax, a lot of these lists are actually published. Now, with archive.org, a lot of different places across the country are putting their old town reports, their poll tax books up online. And who knows, maybe the local historical society has a website or even a Facebook group that you can reach out for somebody who can do a random act of genealogical kindness on your behalf while you're stuck at home and they are too. Boy, that's really great advice. That's good stuff. By the way, most of the stuff at Family Search that requires you to be at a library is uh, from overseas. And that's mm-hmm. because of, uh, you know, the protection that they want for their people over there and privacy, that type of thing. Apparently, they just like to know who's looking at these records. And that's why you have to have an actual login now for Family Search, which wasn't the case in the past. But, hey, great mm-hmm. question. Thank you very much to Jack and David. Thank you for the answer. I think it sounds great. And, of course, if you have a question for Ask Us Anything, you can email us anytime at the very strange email address of askusanything at extremegenes.com. David, stay well, and uh, we will talk to you again next week. Thanks for joining us. You too, and all of you out there. Hey, that is a wrap on this week's show. Thanks so much for joining us, and thanks so much to everybody who's been reaching out to me and checking in on me during my recent illness. Yeah, it's been a little uh, bit of a struggle, but not COVID. And that's the most important thing right there. But in the weeks and months ahead, we're going to hopefully come up with lots of uh, stories to inspire you, to inform you, to help you in your genealogical journey as we continue through this crazy period. I mean, who's writing the script for all this? Hey, if you haven't signed up for our weekly Genie newsletter yet, there's more information and more links for you there that you'll find of interest. Sign up at ExtremeGenes.com or on our Facebook page. Talk to you next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice normal family.